Hi everyone! Welcome back to C1 Novel and Vocab Week 4 video for the novel! Thank you for coming back and I'm so excited to go through the book with you. So let's get started. First, why are we doing this and what are we doing this for? This is for the difficult phrases from our novel and this is to help with cultural fluency. By becoming familiarized with different slang and colloquialisms, which is just a big word for sayings and phrases, students will be able to relate to the novel and incorporate, meaning use, these phrases to convey and show their ideas more precisely and accurately. So today we'll be going over Dragons in a Bag, chapters 9 through 10. So let's get started. Everyone, please go get your book and please turn to page 92, which is the first page of chapter 9. Are you there? I am. And we're going to start at the very top of chapter 9. It says, Who do we have here? Trub asks. I notice that his eyes gleam along with his gold tooth whenever he smiles. This is my friend Vic and his sister Kavita. Trub shakes both their hands and then points to the bench and says, mm, Why don't we sit down? I can think on my feet, but we can make a better plan if we put our heads together. So, and that is the end of our quote. So here I have two that I want to talk about. And first is think on my feet. Think on my feet is an idiom used to describe the ability to think very quickly and make decisions or solve problems effectively in a fast pace or just spontaneous situation. It implies being able to respond very quickly and promptly to a changing circumstances without needing much time for some type of thought. Okay, here, think on my feet is likely originated from the idea of being able to make quick decisions while standing or in motion while you're moving, such as in situations requiring uh, being quick or quick thinking. It's a common expression used in various contexts to describe the ability to respond in a very, very fast manner. So think on my feet really means just to think very quickly while you're moving. Okay, but here Chubb was making that phrase, but he's like, I'm kind of tired. Why don't we sit down? He says, I can think on my feet, but because he was standing, he means it in a literal way, but he's tired and he wants to sit. Here are some examples that we can use this is that uh, during the debate, I had to think on my feet to respond to an unexpected question from the other team. Okay, so think on my feet meaning think very quickly. You're able to make up ideas and answer. Second, here we have put our heads together. Does it really mean like we all just put our heads together like this? and touch heads. No, 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 no. <laughs> Put our heads together is also an idiomatic expression that means to work together, to collaborate, to work together as a group, to come up with ideas, solve problems, or make other decisions. It suggests pulling collective knowledge and skills and perspectives to make and achieve a common goal. So here they're saying, let's put our heads together. Trouble is saying, why don't we all put our heads together? Here, it's likely originated from the physical act of bringing heads close together in a conversation or a collaboration. But this is a metaphorical expression. So we're not literally putting our heads together. It's metaphorically used to encourage teamwork, uh, brainstorming, or just problem solving by combining all of everyone's ideas together. Here we can use this as uh, an example of let's put our heads together to come up with a solution to this problem. So put our heads together. Or you can say the team put their heads together so that they're able to uh, figure out a plan to score the final soccer goal. And here I have some pictures. This is a person and <laughs> they're thinking on their feet. <laughs> and here 
we have everyone putting their hands together, not their heads together, but they're here working together as one team. Okay, so think on my feet and two, put our heads together. Wow, very good. Now let's go to the right next page on 93. I should put my head, or I should put my book like this so I can look at it very quickly. <laughs> Uh, let's start from, hmm, let's start from, so, in the middle of page 93, it says, so, so there are two things we have to do, deliver the dragons and find Ma. Which one do you want to do first? Find Ma, I say without hesitation. When I left her, she was in trouble. The quote, Ma's got a nose for trouble. He says with a chuckle. That's how she found me, of course. There are different kinds of trouble. What's Ma up against this time? A dinosaur, I think. So, a nose for trouble. A nose. We all know where your nose is, right? <laughs> this is just a little baby picture. A nose for trouble. This is an idiom used to describe someone's ability to detect or anticipate or look out for problems or difficulties that may come. It implies that the person has a very keen intuition for recognizing trouble or danger, often based on like subtle cues and observations. So this person's got a nose for trouble. They know that trouble's going to happen. But you can say this phrase many different ways. You can say a nose for something. It doesn't always have to be trouble. So a nose for blah, blah, is a flexible idiom that can be used to describe someone's ability to have a skill for something. For example, a nose for news. Describe someone who has a talent for finding or uncovering newsworthy stories. Or a nose for business, meaning a person who is skilled to make a business. Okay. Uh, first here, a nose for trouble or a nose for something. It is an idiom that was adapted to various different contexts. But it can come from the idea, and it is likely originated from the idea of animals, and particularly dogs, because they have a good nose, right? Using their sense of smell to detect danger or threats in an environment. But this is also a figurative expression used to describe a human's intuition. So like they have that sixth sense that it is correct. Here, um, let's see. He's got a nose for talent and can spot potential stars before anyone else can. So this person has a nose to find talented people that may go into uh, and go on to becoming a celebrity, say. Okay, a nose for trouble. Very good. What do you have a nose for? Let's go to page ninety-eight. This here was a bit um, described in the book, but I wanted to go ahead and explain it to you a little bit more. Uh, let's start here mm, in the middle of page 98. Everyone there? The middle of page 98. And it says that. So the indent where it says that, that sounds like a reasonable plan. So I save my questions until we're back on the stone bench in front of the guardhouse eating greasy burgers and fries. So where have you been? I mean, Mama never told me I had a grandfather living in Brooklyn. Trump takes a long sip of soda and then rattles the ice left in his cup. Well, I can't say I blame her. I've been in and out of the city for the past 20 years. A rolling stone, if you know what I mean. Keep going. I don't, but I solved the riddle myself instead of asking Chubb for an explanation. So here's Jax's explanation. Stones don't usually roll, so I figured Chubb must mean that he wasn't around much when Mama was young. I pretty much knew that already, so I moved to my next question. Are you like a witch or a warlock? So, a rolling stone. Not many people use this phrase, but... I wanted to still explain it to you. 
So a rolling stone is an idiom described someone who frequently moves or travels from place to place, often without settling down in one location or an extended period of time. So here is a rolling stone. <laughs> um, it implies a lifestyle of constant change, movement, and yeah, they're just moving around a lot. The phrase, a rolling stone gathers no moss, is an ancient pro proverb. So this is, is shortened. That has been used for centuries to convey the idea that those who are constantly on the move or changing their circumstances are less likely to become wealthy. But here we just have a rolling stone is a person to describe who just moves around from place to place a lot. Um, we can say, we can use this usually when to describe people who frequently change their homes, like their residences, jobs, or locations, often looking for new experiences. So for example, we can say this as, he's always traveling and exploring new places. He is a real rolling stone. So if you like to move around here and there um, and travel, maybe you are also a rolling stone. So here, Chubb is just explaining that he wasn't really there for Mama when they were younger. As you can see, he was in and out for 20 years. Let's go to page 109. Do, 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 do. Now we're in chapter 10. And I'll start at the very top of page 109 so it's easier for you to follow along. Please follow along with your book. Ready? <laughs> I climbed the two short steps, but then turn and face my grandfather. Where are we going exactly? I really can't say, Jax. The transporter reads our intentions, and we intend to find Ma, wherever she is. So, does that mean we're going back to the land of dinosaurs? I ask in my bravest voice. Trub shakes his head. I doubt Ma would be there, but I think she may be in the vicinity, so to speak. Remember, so to speak, was in our past video, but today we'll be looking at in the vicinity. Okay, in the vicinity is an expression used to indicate that something or someone is nearby in proximity, by location here. So this is the whole map of the world. So it suggests that the person or thing being referred to is not really at a precise or exact location. So here... Um, Trub is saying that Ma is probably somewhere around there, but we don't really know, but not in the dinosaur land. The term vicinity um, comes from the word neighboring or nearby in the Latin roots. So in the vicinity is a straightforward expression that has been used for centuries to describe proximity and closeness to a particular location. So we can Always use this in everyday language and speech. You can say, for example, the restaurant is in the vicinity of the train station, so it's convenient for travelers. Because that restaurant is near the train station in the vicinity, it is easy for travelers to go to. Okay. Again, so to speak is in our past video, but I'll quickly review it. This is an idiomatic expression uh, to indicate that a speaker is using a figurative or metaphorical expression rather than speaking literally. It's often used to make a statement or description may not be entirely accurate if it's taken literally. So, so to speak is commonly used to add emphasis or clarity. Very good. Again, that was in our past video, so I will not spend too much time on that one. Page 110. Let's go right to the next page. Let's see. Ah, let's start at the very top. It says, I think for a moment, if that's where the dragons were born, then there must still be magic there. Trub nods and says, I expect so. Africa is called the cradle of civilization. Know why? Sure, I reply. That's where the human race started out. Right. 
and when humans began to migrate, they took magic with them all over the world. So, the cradle of civilization. So, if you know what a cradle is, it's one of these. And it's where a baby is rocked to sleep or where they are put. When a baby is born and they spend their baby years. <laughs> but, what does it mean when we're talking about the cradle of civilization here? This term is used to describe a region or area where human civilization, human beings, is believed to have originated and developed from. It refers to places where early human societies emerged and developed. So here, the term cradle of civilization originated from the 19th century, uh, used by historians and archaeologists and scholars to refer regions such as Egypt or China. So the cradle of civilization is commonly used in academic and historical contexts to describe the early development of human society. But here, the cradle, the cradle of blah blah can also be used flexibly. It is used metaphorically to just show where it started. As you can see when we have the picture of the cradle, that's where the baby had started to grow up. So it's trying to make you think of it. So it emphasizes the starting point or the birthplace, suggesting, suggesting that the location played a very important role in the development. So here in this cradle, they had a very big important role. That's why the cradle of civilization is when it started. Very good. Now let's go to uh, page 112. Aha, uh -huh. at the very top. Did we just cross dimensions? I asked Chubb. We sure did, he says proudly. Now brace yourself, Jax. We shall land in just a few seconds. My heart starts to race. What world will we step into this time? The transporter shudders and then goes still. Just as I open my mouth to ask if we've arrived, the guardhouse plummets to the ground and lands with a thud. But here, the reason why I read the whole big paragraph here is because I needed it to, to remind ourselves what was happening during this time. Brace yourself. Does anyone know what brace yourself means? When someone says brace yourself, it means to get ready for something. So for something that might be strong or sudden or a bit scary. It's like getting yourself ready for a big bump or a surprise. And the word brace here means to prepare yourself by holding on to something or getting ready for some kind of impact. Remember, we just said there was a thud. Okay? The word brace is used because it's like when you hold on to something tight and steady yourself. So, uh, brace yourself means to get ready. So, when can we use this? Usually when we're on the roller coaster, we can say, as the roller coaster started to steep drop, everyone braced themselves by holding on to the safety bars. Or we can say, before the big wave hit, the surfers braced themselves by holding on to their surfboards tightly. Okay, so here, Jax has to brace himself right before their landing. Brace yourself. Get ready. Get ready. Let's go to page 116 now. One hundred sixteen. Uh, let's start from the very top. How did you know Ma would be here? I ask. I didn't know for sure, Chub replies. But when you showed me that book, I had a feeling Ma might find her way here. Is this where Elroy Jenkins lives? I asked, imagining what it would be to live in such a magical place. Trub shakes his head. Elroy doesn't really stay in one place. He's more of a nomad. A rolling stone? I ask. Trub nods. So, if you didn't know what the word nomad meant, you would have also, there is a hint here in the context where it says a rolling stone, because he didn't 
Jax also didn't know what a nomad meant, so that's why he asked, a rolling stone? Is that what it is? Here, a nomad. Just like we said with rolling stone, it's a person who doesn't have a permanent home and moves around a lot. So they travel from place to place, often with no end destination. It's like they carry their home with them, but their home is wherever they are. So whatever is in that backpack in this picture, that's their home. Uh, nomad, this word, comes from the Greek word, which means roaming or wandering, going place to place. It's been used for thousands of years to describe people who live a lifestyle constant movement. So just like before with uh, a rolling stone, a nomad is a person who continues to travel, go here, go there, go everywhere. Very good. And I believe, oh my goodness, oh, my book's upside down. Ah, I believe this is the last one already. So let's keep going from where I stopped, where it says a rolling stone. I'm going to just continue to read the same page on 116. Trub knots. I don't know if Ma told you this, Jax, but when it comes to the future of magic, there are two camps, so two groups. Those who feel the realms should remain separate, and those who want the realms to merge, come together. Maul's in the first camp, and Elroy's in the second. That's why he sent those dragons to Brooklyn. I expect he thought Ma would come around to his way of thinking on the matter. So Ma wants the magic world and the regular world separate, but Elroy wants them to come together. And Elroy thought Ma would come around to, this, to his way of thinking. To come around. As you can see here, there's an arrow that's coming around, and I have the word come in there. To come around. When someone comes around, it means that they change their mind or opinion about something. And it's like when you didn't want to play a game at first, but you change your mind and decide to join in. So you come around. The phrase comes from the idea of someone moving from one point to another point and changing their position and viewpoint, how they think about something on the topic. So for example, you can say like, at first, Sally didn't want to go to the park, but after her friends convinced her, she came around and decided to go. Or you can say, um, I didn't like broccoli before, but after trying it, I came around and decided I actually like it. Who here likes broccoli? If you said no, maybe you'll come around to it later when you grow up. Or lastly, another example for come around could be, he didn't want a dog at first, but after spending time with one, he came around and realized how fun it could be. So these are all different types of ways that you can use the word or phrase come around. But again, you can also make it past tense and change it to came around. Oh my, we just went over so many different Phrases. I love it. Think on my feet, uh, put our heads together, come around, rolling stone. There's so many that we learned today. I'm so happy that you guys watched today. So please, now what do you have to do? Review and self-study. It's for contextual mastery so that you can become masters. So review the phrases again. Maybe watch the video again. Read out loud. Maybe the parts that I read. And reread the novel where these phrases came from to fully understand. And then lastly, make sure that you complete your novel homework. Okay? There is only one more section left after this video for Dragons in a Bag. And we're going to move on to our next video, or our next book, uh, and two videos later. So hold on tight. Or brace yourself because we're going to have a lot of fun finishing this book. Okay? Thank you so much again for watching, and I'll see you guys next week.